1989 was a great year for pop culture classics, with blockbuster hits that helped to form some of the fabric of our shared language of references and influences. It was also a full 30 years ago, and remembering that while you're watching an old favorite might just make you feel like you're crumbling to dust as the credits roll. The good news? We're here with some emotional support as you remember these movies that were released a full three decades ago. In the 1980s, the only big-screen superhero megastar was Superman, and the last major live-action effort for Batman starred Adam West. Then came director Tim Burton, fresh off of Beetlejuice and an effort to capture some of the more gothic Batman spirit made so popular by the comics of the 70s and 80s. The result was Tim Burton's Batman, a massive commercial hit and one of the most talked-about films of 1989. Michael Keaton starred as the Dark Knight, which was a controversial casting choice at the time since he was mostly known for goofy comedies. It's easy to argue that the real star was Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Wait till they get a load of me. Burton and designer Anton First imagined a Gotham City that lives up to its name with bold set design choices, memorable costumes, a gorgeously lonesome Wayne Manor, and a sweeping score from Danny Elfman that still resonates as Batman's signature theme. The film has its flaws, including a rather contrived origin for the Joker, but even today it holds up as a classic of the genre. Other Batman films have come since, some great and some not so well loved, but Burton's film still holds a certain kind of sway over 80s and 90s kids. It spawned a franchise that would run for a decade and remains one of the most influential superhero films ever made. In fact, virtually every comic book film of the 1990s and even into the 2000s was a reaction to it in some way. The last film installment of the Friday the 13th franchise was an ill-fated reboot in 2009, so it might be difficult to remember that this slasher series was once a box office powerhouse. Producers cranked out eight Friday films in the 1980s and quickly established Jason Voorhees' reputation as an iconic killing machine who just won't go away. Jason Takes Manhattan is not the best of these films, but it is among the most interesting. It follows a group of high school seniors who are all set to take a big trip up to the Big Apple, but there's one problem. Their journey begins at Crystal Lake, where Jason sank at the end of the last film. He's reanimated by an electrical accident, climbs aboard, and begins causing havoc. Sadly, he only really takes Manhattan in the final minutes, but in between there's a brutal and often silly cruise that some Friday fans love and others loathe. Whether you dig the film or not, it remains a fascinating cultural artifact in terms of how far slasher franchises were willing to go in the 80s to keep churning out sequels. Rick Moranis hasn't made a major live-action film appearance in more than 20 years, but once upon a time he was a comedy powerhouse and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was one of his most successful showcases. Moranis is a master of in-over-your-head nerdy comedy, and in that regard, he was perhaps never more perfectly cast than he is in this film. Diane, I got something real important to tell you. Are you trying to tell me the machine works? Do the kids know? Well, yeah, the kids know. That's great! Suburban dad and amateur inventor Wayne Zielinski has created a shrink ray that never seems to quite work, until the day it accidentally shrinks the Zielinski kids and their neighbors, the Thompson children. While Wayne and his wife Diane try desperately to find the kids while keeping the incident under wraps, the kids themselves embark on an epic journey through the backyard. Kids of a certain age watch this film over and over when it hit home video. The middle entry into the Back to the Future seems half forgotten by some viewers, stuck between the original and the one where they go to the Old West. But in many ways, Back to the Future Part II is the most interesting of the three films. For one thing, it's the only one of the three that imagines a version of the future of 2015 rather than jumping to the past. And for another, that future is just bonkers. Hydrate level four, please. <laughs> Though it's definitely weaker than its predecessor, Part 2 is full of instantly memorable moments, from the introduction of the hoverboard to Biff's lair in the bad timeline to the ridiculous fashion choices of 2015. Plus, we will never stop making jokes about the power of sports almanacs because of this movie. With one line, Feel of Dreams cemented its place in the pop culture lexicon as one of the most quoted films ever made. Really, though this movie is so much more than a memorable phrase, it's a sweeping declaration of American optimism, and the kind of movie that will make even the most die-hard baseball haters in your life fall in love with the game, if only for a little while. Field of Dreams didn't need the benefit of time for people to recognize its greatness. It was nominated for three Oscars after its release, including Best Picture, and immediately became the kind of film certain families wanted to rent on home video again and again. In the years since, it's become the kind of basic cable staple on which pretty much everyone in the living room can agree 
three, and even if you're seeing it for the hundredth time, there's a certain kind of magic in its simplicity. Is, is this heaven? It's Iowa. Even the worst Star Trek films are still interesting in their ambition, and Star Trek V The Final Frontier is perhaps the best example of this. Directed by William Shatner, the film chronicles the Enterprise crew's involvement in a quest to find God in a mystical location somewhere in the center of the galaxy. It's a big idea, and even though the results have earned it a reputation among some Trek fans as the single worst piece of the entire franchise, it has its moments. Excuse me, I'd just like to ask a question. What does God need with a starship? Of course, that power is masked by questionable directing choices, subpar visual effects, and a high concept that just kind of fizzles out by the end. Despite all that, it still maintains a sense of personality that makes it pretty watchable. Captain Kirk climbing a mountain and hanging out with Spock and Bones around a campfire together just works. Stephen King adaptations are culturally ubiquitous, and they have been for decades. The man's work is so popular among film producers that he's launched whole franchises from a single short story, and filmmakers are often so eager to capitalize on his name that they'll only very loosely tie their stories to his concepts. We're looking at you here, Lawnmower Man. When an adaptation works, though, it really works, and Pet Cemetery is definitely one of those. The film famously tells the story of a family who moves into a new house near a pet cemetery set up by the local children to bury the animals who are hit by cars on the dangerous nearby road. When the family cat dies, it's buried at the Native American burial ground beyond the pet cemetery, only to be brought back to life, in a manner of speaking, by the land's mysterious powers. Then the family's young son is killed, and the rest is the stuff of nightmares. The climactic the scares of Pet Cemetery are still among the most memorable of any horror film released in the 1980s, and the story is so powerful that it's easy to see why a remake is hitting theaters this spring. For a very long time, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was the final entry in the whip-cracking adventure franchise, and served as the perfect way for Indy to quite literally ride into the sunset. After the misstep of the Temple of Doom, filmmakers George Lucas and Steven Spielberg returned to the trope of Indy searching for fabled religious artifacts and punching out Nazis, and sent him after the Holy Grail of ancient artifacts, which in this case was the literal Holy Grail. Germany has declared war on the Jones boys. The result is a film that's not quite as good as the first because Raiders of the Lost Ark is basically perfect, and something that still holds up three decades later. The chemistry between Indy and his father, Henry Jones Sr., played by the great Sean Connery, is perfect. And while it's not quite the action masterpiece that Raiders was, it's still great adventure fun. Plus, it made us say he chose poorly forever, even if we were just talking about pizza toppings. The canon of great teen comedies of the 1980s is vast and varied. You have your unrepentant sex comedies like Porky's, your slightly more contemplative fare like Sixteen Candles, your dramedies like The Breakfast Club, and plenty of other movies that easily fit into a genre or even bounce between a few of them. Then you've got Heather's, which is something all its own. I've cut off Heather Chandler's head and Heather Duke's head is sprouted back in its place. Heathers took the sense of aggression and venom that was bubbling under the surface of so many other teen comedies and put it front and center, creating a deliciously nasty brew that's as brutal as it is brutally hilarious. Winona Ryder gives one of the best performances of her career, and the film cemented Christian Slater and Shannon Doherty as icons of their era. Though its box office left something to be desired, it became one of the most important cult films of the early 90s video market. We're still feeling its influence today in everything from horror movies to YA novels to its own TV remake. Speaking of teen comedies from the 80s that are in a class by themselves, there's Bill & Ted's Excellent Adventure, a film that combines slacker culture with time travel. If you haven't seen it, the results are exactly as weird as you'd expect. Ted? What? This has been a most unusual day. The great thing about Bill and & Ted and what's allowed it to hold up as well as it has for 30 years is the very real sense of sincerity running throughout the film. It delivers the time travel goods and the slacker comedy goods simultaneously, and it somehow manages to combine all of that with a kind of wish fulfillment as the boys gather a cadre of historical figures together and cram them into a time-traveling phone booth. Most importantly, though, there's a tremendous self-awareness running through the film that allows Bill and Ted to be both genuinely likable and viciously self-deprecating at the same time. It's a deceptively simple movie with some very complex comedy running through it. Oh, and it makes you want to bust out your best air guitar. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon! Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one!